Hello, welcome to the shop, home of everything from the murky to the miraculous. That parade sounds like a lot of fun, doesn't it? I don't really know if it's my kind of thing. Musical instruments, the good ones, that is, tend to be quite old, and like most old items, they have a history. Passing from hand to hand, generation to generation, you never truly know what one carries. Until it's too late, that is. You see that drum on the shelf? It's very old. Dates back to the 17th century, I believe. It happens to be one of those instruments that carries around its story. Would you like to hear it? Good. In that case, take a seat, and I'll tell you the tale of the drummer of Tedworth. They say that this drum is linked to the first recorded poltergeist in England. The story goes that in the town of Ludlow in Wiltshire, a man by the name of William Drury was being a public nuisance. He would walk up and down the streets begging for money while incessantly beating on his drum, much to the displeasure of the locals. On one afternoon, when the drumming was particularly irritating, John Mompesson happened to be passing through Ludlow. Mompesson was a landowner, excise officer, and commission officer in the militia, but is more commonly referred to as a magistrate in contemporary retellings. Importantly, the standing he did have gave him a reason to confront the drummer, who naturally protested, producing documents that supposedly gave him permission to busk. Mompesson identified these as a fake and reported this to the local bailiff. The drum was then confiscated off Drury, much to the displeasure of the vagrant who begged for it to be returned. Perhaps unwisely, Mompesson refused and on his instructions, the bailiff escorted Drury to the nearest justice of the peace to have him tried accordingly for insolence and roguery. Considering his work done, Mompesson returned to his hometown of Tedworth, and nothing notable happened in the coming days. However, all of this changed the following April, when the bailiff delivered the drum to his house for safekeeping. The hauntings that followed were extensive, and a full account of these can be found in A Blow at Modern Seducism in Some Philosophical Considerations About Witchcraft by Joseph Glanville, which was published in 1668. I'm sure you won't want to miss your parade, so I shall give you the story in broad strokes. Then again, by the end of this tale, you might want to wait for the marching band to pass before leaving the shop. Mompesson had been away from his house on a trip for a few days and, on returning, found his wife in a distressed state. She said that thieves had broken in while he was away and terrorised the family, making an almighty mess. Surprisingly, that very night, the supposed thieves returned, as knocking sounds could be heard all about the house. Being a man of action, Mompesson rose from his bed with pistols drawn and searched each room where the sound could be heard. Curiously, each time he opened the door to the room where the knocking originated from, it stopped, only to restart at a different location in the house. Eventually, Mompesson returned to bed, and as he did so, a great drumming started up on the roof, which drifted further and further away as time passed. This reoccurred the next five nights, falling silent every day at dawn. After a month of the sounds existing on the outside of the house, they became more intrusive, locating themselves in the room where the drum was being kept. In here, hollow sounds could be heard throughout all the hours of the night, accompanied by a shaking of the windows and beds. Mompesson could always tell when the next disturbance was coming, as the sound of the drum would be heard travelling all over the house, and this continued for the next two months. As if these circumstances weren't already bad enough, the hauntings then moved to the children's bedroom. To start, the room would be filled with the drumming of well-known songs, but after this, 
the hauntings became more sinister. Under the beds of the children, a deep scratching could be heard, as if being made on the bed frame by iron talons. This would end suddenly, and then they would be violently lifted from their beds and held in the air by an invisible force. The servants of the house would also interact with the demon. In one instance, upon coming across two boards that were moving of their own accord in the children's bedroom, a servant asked for them to be placed in his hand. The boards then moved across the room to the servant. Now this made Montpesson furious, and he forbid the servants from behaving in such a way again. Following this, a sulphurous smell was present throughout the house. Of course, it made sense to enlist the help of a man of God to keep the spirits at bay. The local minister, a Mr. Cragg, answered the call, and so he, along with fellow neighbours, knelt by the children's bedside and prayed. Throughout the prayer, the demon retreated to the cockloft above the room, but alas, once they stopped, it returned with a vengeance. In rage, it threw anything not fixed to the floor around the room, and part of the bed even striking the minister in the leg. Becoming increasingly concerned for his children's safety, Montpesson sent all but his eldest daughter away to stay at a friend's house. The daughter that stayed then slept in his room. However, the hauntings merely followed his eldest daughter, and for the next month a relentless drumming would play throughout the night. Since this effort had clearly not yielded any substantial results, he summoned his other children back to the house. On their return to the house, the children then slept in the parlour, and here the hauntings against them were less violent. For the servants, though, instances of severity grew against them in number, with many being lifted from their beds just as had happened to the children before. The hauntings continued in various ways. One night, the sound changed to that of a jingling bag of money, and on another, one of Montpesson's sons was hit in the ankle by a door latch that had been thrown across the room by the demon. The night after Christmas Day, the demon threw his wife's clothes all about the room, before hiding her Bible in the ashes of the fire. In the following January, its form changed, becoming a series of lights that would appear throughout the house. One of Montpesson's braver servants then offered to stay in the room next to his, armed with his sword. Supposedly, the servant then frequently did battle with the demon. At times, he would slice it where he guessed the apparition would be, and he'd keep it at bay. While on other occasions, the demon would hold him down until he struck at it with his sword. If nothing else, the servant's efforts proved that the demon was afraid, or at least pretending to be afraid, of physical weapons. Montpesson was certain that there was a connection between confiscating the drum and the hauntings that had now plagued his family for some time. This was confirmed when, one night, guests of his asked the demon a series of questions. The first asked the demon to knock three times if Satan had sent him to terrorise Montpesson's family. The demon obliged and knocked three times. The same man asked the demon to knock five times if this was the work of the drummer, Drury. The demon knocked five times. Seeking protection and reassurance, Montpesson asked the local blacksmith to stay. The smithy obliged, but only managed to remain one night, as from evening to dawn, a pair of pincers would constantly snip at the poor man, just inches away from his nose. The form the demon took then changed again, on one occasion whispering throughout the house before rattling chains and on another panting like a tired dog. However, now armed with the knowledge that it feared weapons, one person would slash at where he gauged the demon to be, and so he dealt with the hauntings in this way for some time. It was at this point a strange thing, well, a stranger thing occurred. Montpesson awoke to find his wife's Bible face down in the ashes of the fireplace. It was open to the third chapter of St. Mark, where it describes unclean footprints falling down before our Saviour. After reading this, he decided to spread ashes out on the floor of the chamber to see if the demon left any tracks. He probably wished he hadn't. For the next day, almighty claw marks could be seen spanning the length of the room, 
accompanied by a series of strange symbols that were not of this world. Perhaps the most curious event that Glanville witnessed was that of the Whispering Fireplace. One night, the whispering started up again, repeating the phrase, a witch, at least a hundred times. Disturbed by this, Montpesson identified the source as the fireplace and discharged his pistol into it. On closer examination, they found droplets of blood among the firewood where the pistol shot had landed, and, for the next few days, the house was free from any demonic activity. This respite was short-lived, and the being returned with a vengeance, terrorising the children in extreme ways, throwing their full chamber pots across the room and beating their legs against the posts of their bed. It was around this time the demon showed its true form to one of Montpesson's servants. One night, the servant awoke to a noise in his room, and, at the end of his bed, there were two red, glaring eyes. Paralysed with fear, the servant could do nothing but stare back, and, eventually, the apparition faded back into the darkness. Clearly, the demon was becoming far bolder. Its new set of tricks included turning all the money in one of Montpesson's guests' pockets black, and, on another occasion, it made Montpesson's horse lame, the poor owner discovering the animal near death in its stable, with one of its hind legs rammed into its mouth. However, these pale in comparison to the forms it now took at night. Instead of merely making noises, the demon would take the form of several men and stalk the corridors of the house. Montpesson found the only way to disperse them was to discharge his pistol towards them, at which point they would retreat to a nearby arbour. I suppose you are wondering, how does this haunting end? In truth, I don't think it truly did. Drury was sent to prison for thievery, and while there, boasted that he was responsible for the hauntings at Tedworth. Overheard by the guards, he was tried for this crime and convicted, his sentence being transference overseas. Once he had left the country, the haunting stopped too, but whenever he was rumoured to have returned to England illegally, they would start straight back up again. Now, this story is obviously very old, and no account details exactly what happens to the drum. You are more than welcome to buy this one off the shelf, but ask yourself this. Is it worth the risk? Drury supposedly met a man who gave him an authentic book on witchcraft while he fought as a soldier under Cromwell. All that malice, pain and mistrust placed in a single item. In some ways, I suppose, it's quite the bargain. Not for you? Well, I'd say that's fair. I don't know of anyone who'd want to experience a haunting like that which occurred at Tedworth. to the shop, home of everything from the strange to the stupendous. Is there anything in particular that you are looking for? Toys? I'm afraid that isn't really my area of expertise. I used to have some around here, but I doubt they'd be the kind of thing you'd be interested in. In any case, I believe they're in a museum now. Well, 
most of them, at least. Why don't I tell you about them? And then you can decide whether it's the kind of thing you'd want sitting on your shelf at home. Pull up a chair, and I'll tell you of the Edinburgh Dolls. The year was 1836, and in the height of summer, a group of boys were hunting rabbits on Arthur's Seat, a large hill in Edinburgh that is rumoured to have been one of the possible locations of King Arthur's Camelot. On their hunt, they came across some thin sheets of slate, and upon moving them aside, revealed a small cave containing something very peculiar. Coffins. However, no ordinary caskets of the dead, for the ones they found were only around four inches in length. There were seventeen in total, stacked in two columns of eight, with a single coffin sitting atop the rest. Upon opening the coffins, it was revealed that in each there was a single hand-carved wooden figure. Each of these was adorned in its own unique clothing, and they had all seemingly been custom-made. The Scotsman was the first newspaper to report the discovery, and they claimed that these strange dolls may have a connection to witches that still practice black magic. They followed this trail of thought up some time later, when they published a story concerning the dolls and a series of deaths in a local family. Supposedly, a lady from Edinburgh spoke to the paper and said that her father's business was often visited by a strange man who, in 1837, precisely one year after the coffins were discovered and removed, came in holding a piece of paper. He gave it to her father, and on it were drawn three coffins, much like those discovered on Arthur's seat, with the dates 1837, 1838, and 1840 written underneath. In each of those years, they experienced a death in the family, and at the funeral of his brother, who was the last to die in 1840, the strange man appeared, glaring at the recently bereaved. That was the last time they saw him. Now, it's entirely possible that these are coincidences, but it is certainly quite a strange tale, isn't it? As to the actual purpose of these coffins, well, nobody knows. There are several theories, of course. And one is that when a sailor or friend living overseas died, they would be given an honorific burial through these dolls, while another simply states that they were lucky talismans used by the sailors who would frequent the ports of Edinburgh. Perhaps the most intriguing of the rumours concerns the famous Edinburgh grave robbers Burke and Hare, who would kill vagrants and sell their bodies to the university for dissection. It has been suggested that each doll could represent one of their victims. Of course, this is a pleasing gesture, but it raises more questions about who would do this kind of thing. There has never been a consensus as to the purpose of the dolls, and it is very possible that they may just well be toys. And I suppose that that brings us full circle. I can still check if we have one out the back. No? Well, all right. Go ahead and try elsewhere. I hope that you find what you're looking for. to the shop, home of everything from the twisted to the treacherous. 
How can I help you today? Oh, you're from the restaurant next door. Oh, spillage, you say? Well then, I suppose a mop is what you'll be needing. While I try to help my neighbors whenever I can, I'm afraid getting that mop may be more hassle than it's worth. The cupboard is right here. Feel free to have a look inside, but first I must tell you of the creature known as Bloody Bones. Little is known about this hobgoblin, but what is, is most unpleasant. It is said it can be found lurking in cupboards or crouched in the space under stairs, but looking upon it is most unwise. The few that have, and have survived, give a description of the foul thing, detailing a hunched figure that sits atop a pile of bones. These are supposedly the only remains of whoever disturbed it previously. If you were unfortunate enough for the thing to look at you directly, you would likely see blood running down its face and onto the remnants, the victims below. Hence the name, Bloody Bones. There is a crack in the cupboard, if you want to take a peek. No, I think that's quite a wise move. Paper towels are probably your best bet. A lot safer, I reckon. Welcome to the shop. Are uh, you all right? I must say you do look a little flustered. You're not from around here, are you? Now, London can be a daunting place to those unfamiliar with it, and, well, sometimes, I suppose, even a little dangerous. Funnily enough, you remind me of a young man who came in long ago, asking for directions. The city didn't always used to be the concrete jungle it is now. No, it used to be a far more informal affair, streets and passages arising from use rather than due to any kind of urban planning. And this resulted in an almost maze-like sprawl, none so more confusing than the space between Lincoln's Inn Fields and the Strand. Now they say a young man on the trip from the country had to take a journey through this impromptu labyrinth starting at Portugal Street, with its destination being the Strand. Only, this journey wasn't as simple as it is today. On his first attempt, after many hours navigating his way through the winding streets, to his surprise, he found himself right back where he started, on Portugal Street. The novelty of the city still being amusing to him, he set off again, but, to his dismay, the same result occurred. Again and again this happened, the poor soul never managing to quite reach his destination. After every attempt, his will became a little more dispirited, and eventually this bore into a bitter frustration. The days of searching soon became weeks, and these became months, the slight figure of the man morphing and dissipating into nothing more than a wraith-like shadow that crawled along the walls of the twisting streets. Eventually, that entire area was torn down, in favour of streets with a natural structure and logical plan. As this happened, his spirit too seemed to fade. I don't know if he ever made it to the Strand, but I do find it unlikely. It seems like all the time in the world would be of no help to that poor country traveller. Oh. Apologies for taking up your time. Did you need directions? 
No? Okay, well, I wish you luck in finding your destination. I hope that the city is kinder to you than it was to him. Hello, and welcome to the shop. Here we have everything from the insane to the... I'm sorry, what was that? Ah, you heard screaming. No, none of that here. Uh, perhaps you should hurry home. It's awfully dark tonight, and this storm doesn't look like it'll be letting up. Well, I suppose that's hard of me to deny, isn't it? Put that phone away. There is no need for the police. I assure you, those sounds from upstairs aren't anything malevolent. Just the latest item to be added to our catalogue. Truth be told, my sister and I thought we were receiving a fairly uninteresting cupboard. Yet, here we are. Tell me, have you ever heard of such a thing as a screaming skull? No? Why don't you take a seat? Given what's upstairs, I think you'd rather be comfortable for this. <sighs> Many old English houses have stories involving a so-called screaming skull. Generally, something bad tends to have happened to an occupant of the house and the unfortunate soul makes some specification about what should happen to their remains. If their instructions aren't followed, then strange happenings start to occur. Perhaps an example will illustrate my point better. Burton Agnes Hall is a large residence designed adhering to the principles of Tudor Renaissance architecture by Robert Smithson. Its beautiful exterior and gardens are expertly crafted in order to show the wealth and power of those who call it home. However, Inside its walls looks a tale of terror that has repercussions for even its modern inhabitants. Sir Henry Griffith commissioned the hall as a place to live with his daughters during the 1600s. The youngest of his children was Anne, who was reportedly so taken with its beauty and design that she could talk or think of little else. Just before Burton Agnes was finished, Anne went on a short trip. Upon her return journey, she was attacked by thieves a little while away from the building, and they left her in a terrible state. She was duly transported to her home and remained mostly delirious over the coming days. However, her sister stayed by her bedside and would listen to her fever-induced ramblings. One thing, she insisted, was that part of her was to remain at Burton Agnes after her death. Specifically, her head. To appease their dying sibling, they promised they would, and soon after this, Anne passed away. Naturally, the sisters did not want Anne's severed head to remain in the house, and so buried her whole body in the cemetery of a local church. However, it soon became clear that this was a mistake. Like my friend upstairs is kindly demonstrating, Disturbances started to occur within Bert and Agnes. Bangs and crashes would ring through the hallways in the middle of the night, accompanied by sightings of Anne's ghost, which was most frequently seen in the Queen's state bedroom. In an attempt to stop these occurrences, the sisters had Anne's body exhumed, and this is where hearsay may have crept into this tale. Some say, once the body was dug up, her torso and lower body were all perfectly preserved. However, her head was bare of all flesh, 
and detached from the rest of the corpse, as if ready to be taken back to the hall. Make of that what you will. In any case, once the skull was returned to Bert and Agnes, the paranormal disturbances ceased. Years went by and eventually new owners found themselves living in the hall. The skull was still on display, but after the new inhabitants had visions of grinning skulls torment them on a nightly basis, they decided to bury it in the garden. It was unwise to do this. Anne's ghost returned with a vengeance, and the nightly disturbances increased tenfold with screams heard throughout the house. The owners returned the skull inside, and eventually... It was placed in a secret location within one of the walls. Some rumour this location to be behind the panelling in the Great Hall, but I think the general consensus is that it's probably best not to go hunting for it. Not convinced? How about I tell you of another? There is a tale of a skull in Dorset that can still be seen today if you want something a little more tangible. You do. Good. This tale begins with a man called Azariah Pinney, who was going to be executed in 1685 for high treason due to his involvement with the modern rebellion which aimed to overthrow James II. Luckily for Pinney, it sounds like money being passed into the right hands may have saved his life, for instead of being executed, he was sent off to a plantation in Nevis as a slave. However, his fortune soon turned, and by the end of the 18th century, he had shaken off his status as a slave, and owned a sizable plantation. There the Pinney stayed for a number of years, before eventually selling all their property on Nevis, and returning to England. Specifically, they were returning to the family home, Betiscombe Manor. With them, they brought one of their slaves, so that he could continue to serve the family back home. However, the slave soon became ill and perished not long after taking residence at the house. Now, the slave's dying wish was for his body to be returned to Nevis so that he could rest in his homeland. He also issued a warning that if the Pinney family did not honour this instruction, he would make sure that Betiscombe Manor would have no peace. The Pinneys ignored this expensive request and instead had the slave buried in the cemetery of the local church. Now everything was fine at first, but over the coming months, the slave proved true to his word. Great screams could be heard by passing townsfolk emanating from the freshly filled in grave. Meanwhile at the house, the Pinney family fared no better. Wailings were heard here too, accompanied by bangs and crashes that lasted all hours of the night. They dug up the slave's bones and brought these back to the house in an effort to appease the man. And once they did so, the paranormal activity stopped. The skull was placed up in the attic and for a while it stayed there, although today I hear it now rests in a bureau. I'm sure if you paid the house a visit, they'd gladly show it to you. Huh? Perhaps not then. In any case, a more modern examination of the skull showed that it is in fact the skull of a female, some 3,000 years old, as opposed to a mere few hundred. So. Who really knows what happened to the slave and his body? I feel this fact raises many questions and, quite frankly, answers none. Now that you're aware of these tales, do you think it's wise to call the police? At best, you'll probably be charged with wasting police time and at worst, well, there are some things in the shop that you certainly wouldn't want to be exposed to, and I'm not above reaching into my bag of tricks. Good. Since your silence is secured, feel free to leave. I must say you've taken this all fairly well, better than I was expecting if I'm being honest. Do feel free to come back again, if the moon so takes you. I'm in need of a more, well, willing assistant, as it so happens, and there could be an opening. For now, though, farewell. Good luck on the walk home.